one in four people globally are likely to experience a mental health condition. Um, and that can, can be any number of these things, what we might have put uh, on this list, okay? Um, so just kind of picking out a couple of these as it's kind of stayed uh, static at the moment. Um, insomnia, uh, I can see someone's put there. Maybe that's uh, a few that people have put. Um, insomnia is a symptom. Um, so again, it's not a mental health condition. Um, it's just something that we might experience because we are going through periods of stress, anxiety, and depression maybe, and so then that attributes to us having trouble sleeping, or having trouble staying asleep, um, is what kind of attributes that. So insomnia is a, a symptom. Um, I think some people have put mood disorders, personality disorders, um, again, that's a, a key mental health condition. Um, it's not as common as some of the others that we've got up here, anxiety, depression, um, but they are um, some on there as well. Um, bipolar and schizophrenia are on this list as well. Uh, they're what we call psychosis illnesses. Um, the reason they're psychosis illnesses is because anything that is a psychos uh, psychosis is something where someone may lose sense of reality when they are experiencing an episode of that illness. So not all the time. It's not that they are um, experiencing psychosis all the time while I have that illness. They may be managing it very well, but on occasion, if they experience a particularly difficult situation, they may go into a psychotic episode, uh, which is where they may uh, have delusions. So it may be delusions about their environment or themselves. Um, they may think that they are king of the world and they can do whatever they want. Uh, they may believe that the government is out to get them. So they could have delusional thoughts. Um, it could also be hallucinations, so they could see or hear things that aren't there. So one of the most common things that we hear with schizophrenia is where people hear multiple voices in their heads. Now, that is not to be confused with uh, personality disorders, and um, specifically disassociative identity disorder. Um, it's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, that is what is used to be known as multiple personality disorder. So uh, schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder, completely separate. Um, not the same at all. So schizophrenia is not where people have multiple personalities. Schizophrenia is where someone might experience hallucinations, delusions as part of their condition. So hearing voices doesn't mean you've got other personalities. Um, they're just voices that appear in your head telling you to do things or um, usually having negative thoughts about yourself. So the voices might say bad things about you, saying that you've um, got no worth, that you're um, not good at your job, that nobody likes you, things like that. They, they could be common things that happen within schizophrenia. Um, burnout, I just want to touch on there because it's, it's there. And uh, again, it's one of the uh, larger words. Burnout, um, the World Health Organization did recognize burnout as a condition. Um, in 2020, uh, so this year, um, and they're slowly starting to release particular bits of information about what that looks like. So yes, that's very much focused on work life at the moment, but people can experience burnout with their personal lives as well. So what, what I'd just like to do now is just go into anxiety and depression in a little bit more detail, just so we can understand some of these uh, key principles. Um, so. The common mental health illnesses are as follows. Um, anxiety, which we've uh, just discussed. So a prolonged symptom of stress affects someone day to day. Um, we have depression. So the inability to shake off a low mood. Uh, feelings of unhappiness. Sorry, it involves more than feelings of unhappiness. Um, and it's mainly focused on the fact that someone can't shake those feelings. So with uh, depression, um, we use depression as a kind of day-to-day -day word. Uh, I'm feeling depressed. Um, you're not, okay? You're not feeling depressed. Uh, you may have a low mood, okay? Um, and again, this is one of the things uh, when I was briefly talking about stigma and lack of understanding. The, la the lack of understanding around the words that we use is partly the reason why people don't feel confident coming forward and speaking about their illnesses. Um, so when people just say, oh yeah, I felt depressed every now and then, 
that's what kind of undermines people's true illnesses. So it's really important for us to try and think about the way in which we use um, the words and think, yeah, do you know what? I'm experiencing a low mood. I'm feeling down today. Okay. They're more uh, acceptable ways to kind of use that phrase. Um, anxiety is a little bit different because we all experience anxiety. We can get anxious, um, but you don't use it in that turn of phrase where you say it as if, oh, I've got anxiety in me because I'm, I'm always worried. Well, are you? Do you kind of generally feel okay the majority of the time? Um, you know, if you are worried about whether you're anxious a lot of the time, then there's certain, uh, I forgot the word now, certain questionnaires uh, that you can utilize to try and see if that's something that's affecting you. Uh, more regularly than not. So do be aware of the phrasing that you use with regards to anxiety and depression. Um, bipolar um, is previously called manic depression. So you may have heard it being called that. And the reason for that is because it's two different elements. It's mania, when someone is experiencing extreme highs, um, and then the depression, when someone uh, experiences a, an extremely low mood to a depressive state. What's interesting about bipolar is it's not just those two extremes that happen all the time. Some people can experience one more than the other. Um, some people can experience them cyclic, so uh, they can go into a mania and then depression and the mania and depression and keep going around in a circle. And um, so there's lots of different categories of bipolar. So again, this is just helping us understand that just because we hear that someone is bipolar um, doesn't again mean that they just have kind of um, they're a moody person, that might not always happen, okay? So they might just be uh, very outgoing a lot of the time, but then sometimes they might just hit a real extreme low for a period of time and then kind of go back to being uh, the kind of regular self. It could be someone that goes really extreme uh, and their behavior is very erratic, um, very risk-taking, um, and then they could come back down to what we might notice them as a regular behavior so it doesn't mean that someone is going to ex experience both extremes with bipolar so again just that little bit of understanding and, and then we've got many others uh, which you guys mentioned on uh, our screen there so we've got uh, OCD obsessive compulsive disorder and um, so again um, be aware of the way in which you use the phrasing of OCD. OCD is not because you like the labels of your tins facing the right way in your cupboards. It's not because you like a tidy home or a tidy desk. That is not OCD, okay? Um, OCD is two parts. So it's obsessive thoughts. So thoughts that pop into your head um, regularly um, in certain situations, uh, they can be quite, um, hurtful to those people they be, can be quite uh, disruptive to their general day-to-day -day work um, and those obsessive thoughts are usually something if i use an example of maybe someone who uh, doesn't like germs especially in this environment we're all or should be washing our hands or keeping our hands sanitized um, that could be uh, an obsessive thought that someone has um, that if they don't wash their hands um, then their family will be murdered that's an extreme obsessive thought, okay? Um, because of that, their compulsion is to ensure that they wash their hands as much as they can. Um, they may do it four or five times uh, within an hour. They could do it even more, and they could do it every time they touch something new. That obsessive thought could pop back into their head, so they, they have the compulsion to do that action to uh, stop that from happening. A very kind of disruptive thought that enters into their head so not just because you want a tidy desk so you feel a bit uh, better about yourself and tidy tidy uh, desk tidy mind whatever you say um, phobias I'm sure we've heard quite a few about um, so um, agoraphobia is probably uh, a, quite a common phobia for people to experience especially uh, alongside anxiety um, so uh, agoraphobia is the fear of large open spaces with no escape. Um, so it can be contributed to uh, not wanting to leave your home, uh, but that's not the phobia as sometimes it's misinterpreted as. Um, so it's the fear of large open spaces with no escape. So the reason some people don't want to leave their house is because that space is huge. They don't know what's going to happen to them being out in that space. And they then have that kind of fear or anxiety that they can't get back to their safe space. 
claustrophobia is the opposite of agoraphobia because that's the fear of small spaces with no escape. So those are two common phobias. And then you've got phobias about um, animals or insects. So um, arachnophobia and the fear of spiders. Um, schizophrenia, I briefly mentioned before, also personality disorders, but also uh, addictions and eating disorders. So I did see eating disorders on the list. Uh, forgive me if you can see addictions, but addictions can come in the form of um, drugs, alcohol, um, uh, all sorts of different things you can be addicted to, to any kind of particular element. Um, so that could be in the form of misuse or abuse uh, as well. Eating disorders, um, anorexia, um, uh, bulimia, uh, body dysmorphia, all those kind of elements fall under that. So already, just by looking at this slide, we can already see that there's many different mental health illnesses that might affect people um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And we might not have known all of these, or we might know some. So again, what I would urge you to do is, in order to help with the stigma and help you understand a little bit more, is go and research some of them, find out a little bit more about them, um, visit websites. So although there might not be anything major around here in the UAE and the Middle East at the moment, um, do go on to some of those websites that exist in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, um, the UK. They all have really good charitable um, websites that give good information about those illnesses. When you read them, it doesn't make you a doctor, okay? It doesn't make you someone who can uh, diagnose people. It just gives you an awareness so that if someone does speak to you, you kind of have a bit of an understanding of what that illness might pertain to them. But what I'd always say is just ask questions. Don't assume and go, oh, Um, so our next one, um, I just want to ask you a quick true or false question. Um, so visit your polleverywhere.com slash ignite train 999. So it's at the top of the screen if you want to type that in. Um, and again, just want you to say uh, the true or false to this statement. Anxiety is one of the most prevalent mental health problems, yet it is still underreported, underdiagnosed and undertreated. So all right, we've got 100% true already. I'll give uh, that a little bit longer. Then there just are see if anyone... two questions. Uh, if it's okay to just leave them towards yeah. the end, that would go, unless it's, unless it's relevant right to this. And that's uh, fine. I'm, I'm, I'm logging them all um, and we do it at the end then. Go. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, yeah, we will get to your questions. I'm sure there's going to be many. Um, all right. So I'm, I'm going to kind of cut that there. It looks like 100 percent. Yeah, definitely. Um, anxiety is one of the more, one of the most prevalent. Um, and we're going to see that in a minute when I kind of show you some of the key stats um, from around the area. But people experience anxiety um, and don't get help, uh, don't get the support professionally. So they're not locked. Um, we don't get those diagnoses um, and we don't give people the correct treatment. So it may be that those people experience anxiety on a regular basis because they've not adopted the tools to in order, uh, in order to help them with that problem. So again, going back to stigma, which is kind of what it's all going to be about, it could be that people don't feel confident coming forward with this information. They might be kind of swayed by their own uh, kind of family's interpretations of mental health. It might be about their friends or their, their workplace. It's extremely important for you to come forward and understand uh, a little bit more about this, you know, get some help from a professional. Speak to your GP at the very least. Um, just visit a doctor just to get some initial support. Um, I know it's very difficult, again, being in this region, not everyone is covered with, with mental health, with their insurance. So again, do check up on that because that's going to be a, a huge help if you are. Um, but again, I, I'd kind of put it to something else. You know, some of the physical uh, illnesses that we might experience might not all be covered under our uh, medical insurance. But would that prevent us from paying to get, make ourselves feel better? So again, even if it's your mental health, it's really important to try and get some level of support in order to try and do that. So we're definitely right with true. And let's have a look at what that means uh, for stress and anxiety. 
So, yep, we've already looked at what uh, anxiety is. It's a prolonged period of stress. So I already mentioned about how stress is different to anxiety before. Um, so when stress is prolonged, that's when it may become anxiety. So it often leads to regular negative thoughts. People could catastrophize situations. So what I mean by that is they may enter into a particular situation like um, going to visit new people at a social event way after this is uh, finished. Um, and they may believe that those people are going to think that they are very stupid and irresponsible and nobody's going to like them. Everyone's going to look at them funny and everyone's going to end up kicking them out of the uh, social engagement. That is kind of making something that's very unlikely to happen within that situation. Um, there might be some people that think some of those things, but it's not going to be everyone. So again, it could be that people constantly have these negative thoughts. Uh, what causes anxiety? Well, yep, stress is one of the main causes. Uh, the buildup of stress, how it's constant, if it's not managed, can lead to anxiety disorders. And it could be the person that we are. So yeah, we could be the type of person that doesn't have great emotional intelligence, can't kind of understand our own situation, um, misinterprets others' meanings uh, in their conversations, and then take that to heart, and that could build up as well. Um, life events and circumstances are uh, a key attribute to anxiety. So um, we could uh, feel anxious because of particular situations such as, you know, um, not progressing at work, um, not getting the promotion that we want. Maybe um, if you uh, did listen to our stress one, it can also be positive elements. So becoming a parent, getting married, they could bring about stresses that could then become anxiety disorders also. And previous experiences as well. So uh, again, it could be a kind of a, a, a learned experience where when we've attended something previously, we've had a bad experience. So again, we build up all this stress and negative thoughts that if we experience that similar situation, we're going to experience the same outcome. So again, those can uh, contribute to anxiety as well. The effects um, of anxiety are physical. Um, they can have an impact on uh, the way our body works. So just like stress, anxiety brings about um, a racing heart, um, deep breaths or kind of a shallow uh, breathing to try and get as much oxygen to our uh, lungs as possible. Um, we could uh, become sweaty because uh, the blood's rushing to our muscles to try and help us flee or fight. And um, so again, it could try and keep us cool so we could sweat. And we could have those negative thoughts that we've mentioned already and they become a regular occurrence. Um, and our behavior could be affected. So we could uh, be quite snappy at people. We could uh, we kind of go back into ourselves and not really engage with people. Um, we might have uh, a, a difficulty like with our thought processes and things like that. So they could all come out with regards to our behavior. And then lastly, some key points about anxiety. Um, it is one of the most prominent illnesses. So when you think about one in four people globally experiencing a mental health condition in any one year, um, most likely people are going to experience anxiety. Um, anxiety is one of, those others that, uh, one of those illnesses that can lead to other illnesses as well. So again, by experiencing anxiety, it's more likely that you're going to experience other anxiety-based illnesses such as phobias such as PTSD um, you may also experience depression so because I've not got suffer with anxiety or depression so bear that in mind that anxiety is likely to breed depression depression is likely to breed anxiety as well so it's very uh, interesting that those two are commonplace um, and it can be sparked by new situations, traumas, or memories. So it's not just something um, that sticks with people because of a previous experience. It could be something new. Um, it can be done for many different reasons. Um, so my next question uh, to you guys then, just to keep you engaged. Uh, how many people in the UAE were diagnosed with anxiety disorders in 2017? And that is according to the Global Burden of Disease 2017 report. So again, get yourselves on poll everywhere. Um, so we've got 124,000, 
1.3 million. So, okay, so we've got quite a few bits going here. It looks like 457,000 is in the lead at the moment, 44%. Some of the others just hovering around late 20s, teens. All right, it looks like things have kind of stopped around there. Um, it is uh, 457,000 if you've done that. So give or take um, a few hundred, uh, but that's what we're kind of looking at at the moment. So given that the UAE is a population of around 9.8 million, um, that's still kind of a, a significant amount of people that are being diagnosed. But just like we've said before, it's considered one of the most prominent, but people don't come forward. So how high could it potentially be well we might look at those numbers and go well how is it as a representation of the, the rest of the area so uh, here's a little map of some common places within the middle east um, and just to give you a bit of an overview if we look at bahrain um, which is just uh, hovering just around here uh, about 5.1 percent of people in bahrain experience or sorry have been diagnosed with anxiety in the same year um, if we look at Kuwait, uh, then that's 5.5, so again, a little bit higher. As we move on to Oman, uh, we've got 4.8%. Qatar, 4.9%. Saudi Arabia, 5.2%. So again, given a uh, number of people, um, it's just kind of retrospective percentages, so we're not necessarily looking at the actual numbers that we have here. Um, but but if we do compare that to the UAE, uh, 4.8. So uh, yeah, UAE and Oman, kind of the, the lower numbers of kind of those common uh, Middle Eastern areas. Um, and then uh, Kuwait kind of being that higher one of those. Um, the average across the Middle East um, is around kind of 5%. So it kind of hovers around. Uh, again. Um, this is just what's reported, people who have gone and sought help and been diagnosed. So again, how many people don't with this? So that's just a nice kind of visual to see there. If we move on to um, low mood and depression, just like I mentioned about stress and anxiety being different, low mood and depression are also different. So low mood is something that we all experience. You know, we may be going through it right now. I think someone put it on the, how are you feeling board before? Yeah, we you know, we're stuck indoors. Potentially we can only go out to a few select places. We can't go out and visit the people that we would normally visit because of kind of our physical distancing. And we can't do the things that we'd normally do, such as going out to the mall, going to a restaurant, um, being able to just kind of go out on the evenings to the beach or something like that. So it's likely that we're all going to experience low moods. We're not all going to experience depression, okay? Um, depression is uh, something a little bit different, and that is where it's more, of, more than that feeling of unhappiness, like we saw before. It affects the body as well as the mind because, um, again, we're not being overly active. So our, our muscles get a lot tighter, which makes us feel very restricted. Again, that kind of breeds about mental uh, thoughts because we feel like we can't do anything and we're just confined to doing things. So, again, it's, it's that kind of mental health illness that does very much attribute to physical elements as well. Um, it's... There's usually a period of two weeks that doctors call watchful waiting, where if someone is experiencing low moods constantly on a daily basis, very difficult to shake them off. Um, they will give them tools and techniques to use to try and uh, shake off that low mood. And if that is still persistent after two weeks, that's when they are likely to be diagnosed. So again, if you do think about um, seeking help, um, it is a, more responsible of a medical profession to take those two weeks watchful waiting to see if can your mood be improved um, over the next two weeks. If not, then it's likely to be depression. Um, lots of things cause depression. Um, again, life events. It could be the loss of someone um, that brings about that. I saw someone uh, mention postnatal depression before. There's also prenatal depression. So again, even though we consider pregnancy to be quite a, a joyful thing, some people can be 
uh, really affected by that and couldn't experience pre or postnatal depression as a result of that. So certain life events can bring that about. Um, circumstances, so the fact that we, uh, yeah, this is a perfect circumstance, we're a bit restricted in our ability to do things, so that could potentially uh, bring about some of those uh, feelings that could cause depression. Um, physical illness, so not being able to do what you would normally do on a day-to-day -day basis, again, is a key aspect of uh, developing depression. So again, people who may uh, lose their limbs or um, not be able to do things that they would normally do, so maybe um, uh, not being able to physically move in the way that they did, so if they've got uh, muscular problems, again, that can um, severely impact depression. So just as we mentioned before, it's very much a mind-body thing. Um, and unfortunately, um, depression has been linked to uh, your genes as well. So not the genes that you might wear in the winter, but um, your genes that make up your DNA. Um, if your parents have suffered from depression, it's more likely that you might experience depression as well. Um, so there is those debates over nature and nurture that exist here, um, but there are a number of studies that show that genes are uh, partially responsible also. Um, the effects of depression, you know, feelings of hopelessness, you could become withdrawn and not want to engage with people. Um, you find it very difficult to continue relationships that you might have and even more difficult to build new ones. Um, and depression obviously affects our eating habits. So again, low moods also affects our eating patterns. So some of us might be in um, some things that we don't always eat on a day-to-day -day basis, being stuck at home. So we're always going snacking on food, getting a bit of crisps, some chocolate maybe. Um, and that's just us kind of being more comfortable in our environment. So again, don't think, oh, I'm eating more snacks. So it looks like I'm developing depression. Certainly not. Um, but do make sure that you do uh, other things such as exercise and things to counteract that. And then key points, um, yeah, it can have a huge effect on uh, the people surrounding those that have depression. Um, so people don't always think about this, but if you are very close to someone who is suffering from depression, that in itself is something very difficult um, because by all means you want to be supportive of that person. Um, but we, again, we're human, so it can also lead to things like guilt, that you can't help that person out of that situation. Um, frustration, because maybe they're not doing the things that you want to do. Um, you know, you might want to go out and they don't, and so that would become quite frustrating for you. Uh, and then even anger is a more serious emotion, because uh, you could become even more angry that they are not kind of feeling better. And as we've said, it's not something that you can just shake off. So again, that common thing that's often said with depression as well, it's just, oh, just shake it off, you'll be all right, um, it'll pass. Unfortunately, with people experiencing depression, that's not always the case. Um, in a lot of cases with depression, people don't often know why they are depressed. Uh, they can't actually physically, emotionally understand that reason as to why they are depressed. It's just a certain feeling that overcomes them and overpowers them so again it's not always easy as just putting your finger on something and going let's deal with that so there's some key points about uh, low mood and depression um, and we've got another uh, map here of where we can see some of those common ones so I'll just kind of speed up through this because we know where we're visiting uh, Bahrain 4.4 percent uh, Kuwait 4 percent uh, Oman is 3.6 percent um, Qatar going to 4%, Saudi Arabia 3.8, and then the UAE 3.5. So again, depression is usually a, a quite a common uh, illness that people experience. It's quite close to the number of people, um, anxiety. But again, um, this might show that people don't necessarily come forward because we would generally expect to see a higher number. And once again, depression is usually around kind of the 4.5% mark um, globally. Um, again, that's people coming forward. A lot of people deal with depression without getting any support, without being diagnosed, um, and find it very difficult to kind of move on from that, but don't seek that help. So, you know, it might be attributed to the fact that, um, you know, a lot of things are done here to try and make us the happiest city in the world. Um, so maybe that contributes to the fact that people don't feel um, maybe as in a low mood to go and 
get help and support because they feel a little bit happier maybe. Um, so that might contribute to the low numbers. But um, personally, I do think it's because we don't come forward and, and speak about it. Uh, one of the last kind of key polls um, before I hand over to uh, my colleague Ben, just to give you a bit of a, a run through of other things that we can offer. Um, I just want to ask you, which mental health condition do you think is the most prevalent in the UAE? And your options are schizophrenia, anxiety, depression, stress, or substance use disorders. Okay, so we've got a lot of people saying stress. We've got third saying depression, anxiety is creeping up a little bit. Few people have said substance use disorders, and we've got a little bit of schizophrenia as well. Um, okay, so it looks like. Um, stress is kind of leading the way with way over half of, of the votes there. Um, all this tells me is you weren't listening earlier and um, stress is not a mental health condition. Um, it's something that we all experience. So 50% uh, of you um, should have been listening. Um, and then it's slowly starting to decrease now as people change their answers. Um, but we can see that anxiety is probably the highest. And if you were paying attention to the maps, then you would have seen that that is the highest one. Um, but unfortunately, substance use disorders is the highest uh, mental health condition that's most prevalent in the UAE at the moment. Um, so yeah, that's uh, way over 5.6% if I remember correctly. Um, so that is the misuse of uh, all the different types of drugs, um, opiates, um, cannabis. Um, it could be uh, alcohol misuse uh, as well. So all those kind of factor into that. Um, substance use disorders which we don't always think about and we think that oh well you know um, they're kind of managed over here it's a, it's a it's illegal but then most substances are illegal in most countries and it's still generally a high number of people that experience them so uh yeah do be aware that that's uh, one of the highest substance use disorders but once again how many people come forward if you are experiencing substance use disorder, you're more likely to try and seek help because um, of the limitations it brings about. Most of us, because anxiety and depression is usually considered a neurosis condition, which means anxiety and amplification of stress, depression and amplification of low moods, we can relate to those. So we see them as day-to-day -day things and we don't always get help and support. So. Uh, that kind of leads me to uh, a kind of our final point. So before I ask you guys to um, kind of move on to what Ben's going to say, I'm just going to tell you a few key things about what you can do to help your own mental health. So as you can see here, the biggest one is talk. Talk to people about how you're feeling. Um, more and more studies are showing that talking therapies are the best way to help someone through their mental health problems. Um, that means that you know us talking about our problems helps eliminate some of the feelings that we're uh, experiencing so do talk to people if you're experiencing something try and speak to someone who you trust um, and maybe try and break a little bit of ice to try and understand what their thoughts on mental health are because again if you open up to someone who still carries a lot of stigma and doesn't really understand how mental health affects people mental ill health affects people um you might not get the conversation you're looking for where you can though uh, do try and get professional help if you think it's very serious do your own research. Um, so I'm not talking about looking on uh, mum's net here or WebMD because um, you'll probably end up feeling that you've got worse conditions than what you generally are. But do look at um, reputable mental health websites. Uh, Mind in the UK, the Mental Health Foundation, very good websites that hold key information about um, those illnesses. I believe one has started up in the UAE. Um, I think it's called mentalhealth.ae and they've got some interesting information about uh, mental health illnesses on their website as well. Um, do try and identify your own triggers. So what sets off these low moods or these stresses for you and try to deal with them individually um, because tackling that particular problem is likely to uh, prevent it from becoming a more serious problem down the line. Um, cats, um, don't, don't buy cats or, or get, get the strays. Um, stay away from particular cats. So caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, sugars. 
uh, they all attribute to us feeling more anxious, um, worse in our low moods. Um, so again, we often have a bad day and might uh, have a cigarette or something like that. That's actually going to worsen our feelings in the long run. It doesn't make them go away, it just temporarily suspends. Um, it's not a good thing to utilize. Keep a diary about how you've been feeling because then you can track what potentially those triggers might be. Um, and it's just nice to try and get those thoughts and feelings onto paper. Some people feel that by doing that, it removes it out of their head, puts it on paper. It's to be dealt with a different way. So that's a nice thing to utilize as well. I've already talked about professional help if you feel it's a serious issue. So do try and seek that out uh, as much as you can. Um, I know it's very difficult for some people. So. Uh, name the feeling, so give the uh, feeling a name. So I was uh, reading a book uh, a while ago, it's called A Beginner's Guide to Mental Health, um, and the lady who wrote that um, calls her uh, anxiety Nigel. Um, and it's just again a, a way of distancing yourself from that. So oh, Nigel's back again, I'm feeling worried, I'm feeling like I'm catastrophizing things. Let's try and move Nigel away. Uh, and it's just a way of kind of making a, a connection with that that makes it easier for you to distance yourself. Um, and then most importantly, uh, just after talking is be active. Um, the uh, chemicals that we release during exercise are great ways to increase our kind of uh, behavior, our feelings. Um, so try and think about getting some of those endorphins released into your body um, to make yourself feel that little bit better day to day so do be active so there's some key um, elements um, of kind of helping yourself with mental health um, moving on to the next one is just our learning journey so Ben would you like to uh, jump in now and just give people a, an overview on this yes hi guys good morning good morning I um, look thank you before I get started just say thank you to everyone so much for being so engaged with this um, look it's been very very nice for us uh, look as a training company to be able to put content out and help everybody because um, I know everybody's stuck inside but what we wanted just to quickly do is just briefly explain look what we're doing now is putting out this bite-sized information for everybody so please do share it with your teams get everybody to come on board but we do have an ability to actually run these webinars in a lot more detail so as you can probably see on the screen we've called it our locked in learning journey um, before I get started, we will be doing the Q and A in about thirty seconds once I've done once I've spoken about this. Um, but look, in essence, what we can do with the webinars is that we can create a journey for you and your teams um, on different series. So we've got five different series that we've spoken to companies about for stress management, leading virtual teams, coaching and feedback, uh, mental well-being, and virtual sales. So what we have done is build in a piece of online journey, um, which is a program we use called Practify. And what Practify does is actually enable us to make the learning stick because we can send out tasks, we can send out, in essence, homework notifications and really bring the learning to light. So we do it in a number of different phases that are sped over a one month period. So phase one all the way through to eight. Um, next one, please, Ben. Um, in essence, look, we are running this in two ways. We're running this as an in-house program for organizations um, for 10,000 dirhams. So that's for four webinars, four 60-minute webinars. And then also as individuals, uh, we're running these as open courses at 750 dirhams per person with the courses starting in mid-April. Um, that was just literally look, just to let you guys know that beyond this, look, we, we are here and we can help you beyond these sessions that we will continue to run. Um, now I will chuck over to Russell, who will ask Ben for the Q&A. Great. Thank you, Ben. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I can see um, quite, uh, quite a few of you sticking around for this. So, uh, look, I, I'll be honest, we got quite a few questions. Some went on the group um, live, so everyone saw them already, and quite a few were sent to me directly. So, uh, I don't know if we'll have time to get through these, but, but we'll, we'll pick a few of those. Um, I'm not going to name names because um, some of them you know, might, might be coming from personal uh, experience, but if that person wants to you know, kind of chip in and expand on the question, then please feel free to do so. 
Um, okay, let's have a quick look. All right, so question number one. Um, this came in quite early, uh, Ben, when you were talking about types of mental okay. illness. Is self-sabotage a mental health illness? Uh, self-sabotage isn't uh, a mental health illness, no. Um, it depends what you might mean by sabotage. So uh, I don't know if anyone wants to clarify that. Yeah, I'm not too sure. Um, cause obviously, I know who's, who's It's on. okay. Yeah, but if, if they mean sabotage of the, the self, the body, um, then no, that's a symptom um, of certain ones. So people may harm themselves in order to feel good. So um, again, dopamine and endorphins are released when the body is harmed because it tries to make us in a more sense of feeling good rather than feeling injured. Um, so some people get a little bit addicted to, to that behavior and some people use it as a a way of kind of punishing themselves um, because of the way they're feeling. So if it's self-sabotage in that respect, um, it's not a, a mental health illness, but it is a symptom of a number of them. If it's more self-sabotage about how you make yourself feel bad and it's kind of like a self-esteem issue, again, that comes under a, a symptom rather than a mental health uh, issue or condition. Okay, good. Thank you. Um... Next question. Do you believe that the COVID slash coronavirus situation is making us more OCD? Question um, mark. And this person went on to say, I for one keep over cleaning my hands and getting obsessive thoughts. Um, and then openly said that I was quite prone to this as a kid. So is, is COVID making us more OCD? Um, I th I th it's not. It's just making us more aware of uh, kind of hygiene. Um, so because there's a potential risk, it's not that we're getting an obsessive thought that is making a potentially something bad happening that is very unlikely to happen. You know, if we don't wash our hands or don't keep things clean, there is more of a chance that we may contract uh, the illness, the virus, in case we've been in contact with other people. Um, but it's not making us become more OCD. It's just making us become more aware of how we deal with our hygiene. So we are generally thinking, I should clean my hands and mm. my worktops or whatever because it saves me from this true um, virus. So it's not OCD at all. It's just as being conscious. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, that one's actually more of a comment. Do you think due to social or physical distancing and people being stuck at home for weeks, uh, once this is all over, do you think some people will have psychological problems, especially those that live alone? Uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to answer that. Um, I suppose on a, on a very personal uh, note, and my, my own opinion um, is simply that I think people will become uh, more impacted whilst this is going on. I think after um, we kind of feel a lot more safer to be out, that's going to make people feel it's going to lift people's moods. And um, so that might kind of negate a lot of the feelings that we're potentially feeling now. Um, I think because we're not able to do some of those things that we would normally do, that's what generally makes us feel a little bit lower. But what I would encourage people to do is, you know, I'm sure many of you have looked on the internet about things that are uh, happening to keep people active, you know, doing things on YouTube where people are doing free exercises, again, energy up. Um, if your families are here, then kind of constantly kind of being with them, doing uh, fun activities to try and keep you all engaged, um, doing something different like having a, uh, a a nicer meal than you would normally cook to try and make it a bit like a a special meal for the for the family or your partner or whatever. Just doing little things like that is is how we keep our mood up. If we don't do anything and we just constantly think, oh, all I'm doing is being on my laptop doing work, staying in the same house, you're just going to kind of fall into that kind of pit. So do make sure that you segment your time effectively to do different things to keep your mood up. Cool. Good stuff. All right. Awesome. Um, let's have a look. There's a couple more here. Can learning disorders trigger mental health problems? Um, yes. Um, so they, it's more common for people with uh, learning disabilities or learning development uh, problems so uh, autism for example um, it may be that they are more likely to experience mental health issues because of they may not have good social interactions so therefore that may make them feel a little bit more depressed uh, overall and so that could lead to depression and so that that could be something um, again not being able to do things how other people do them could 
develop anxiety. So if you are potentially dyslexic, uh, so if dyslexics, um, then you um, could have the feeling that other people may think badly of you because you may get letters mixed up things like that you may not be able to read things out loud so that could bring about more anxiety but again some people deal with that on a regular basis and just openly say um yeah i'm dyslexic so i'm unable to do this or you may see some errors please don't hold it against me so again they kind of break down some of those key barriers initially but they can bring about mental health illnesses more so if you suffer from them Interesting. Perfect. And one more for you. And apologies for everyone else whose questions maybe didn't get asked. We, we can always come back to these later on. Um, I thought this would be an interesting one uh, because this is potentially with what, why some of these stigmas attached and maybe why some of those statistics are, are as low as they are. Um, yeah. Do you think that there is a lack of people who would be non-judgmental when you feel or you talk your heart out? So if that, that, I mean, that's verbatim, but the, the, I think what the person is asking is, you know, if I do speak out and I'm speaking about my internal feelings, my emotional state, do you think there's going to be a lot more people that are going to be, you know, judging me? Or do you think there's enough people that are non-judgmental enough and aware enough to, to manage these conversations? Actually, then, yeah, ben, it's sorry, cool. then I've got one more I will ask you because I've just seen it. In this <laughs> right, okay. Uh, well, if, again, it's a difficult one because it's, it's not necessarily knowing people. Um, I think, Deep down, if someone does open up, the majority of people are probably going to be a bit more understanding of that situation. Um, but that, that can't account for some people that just won't care um, or not be very good at, at responding to that. And what I would say is if you are feeling that you want to pull your heart out uh, to kind of loosely use the phrasing and um, make sure it's someone who you trust because if you just try and do it to the, any person that you see next you you don't really know them or how they might react so do make sure it's someone who's close to you because they're going to be the most understanding um, or again if you can see a professional they're going to be the most understanding of anyone because they train in that area so where possible try not to be afraid because again, that just adds to the stigma of not sharing. So do try and share, um, but just be prepared that most people don't know what this is going to be like for you and everyone's experience is different. So even if someone else has experienced anxiety and you're suffering with anxiety and you speak to someone, your uh, experiences might not be the same. So you might not have the, uh, the same connection as what you expect because everybody is different. Everyone's um, illness affects them in a different way. Mm. So do be aware of that as well. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so last one is two parts, but I just asked the first part. What kind of help is needed when we think a colleague's mental health is unstable? Unstable. Um, I just think that that might be a nice segue to talk about IAX, if I'm being honest, because I, I think that, that, <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's the toolkit there, right? Yeah, so... Uh, what I was going to say is obviously this is just a taster and we've not gone through all the key skills. So we've kind of mostly talked about how you can support yourself. Um, a lot of those skills are transferable. So again, if you notice that a colleague is potentially in a difficult situation, um, maybe unstable if you see that, the best thing to do is try and talk to them. Um, make them know that this is a safe space. They can speak to you. And that's going to be one of the key elements. But yeah, quite rightly, as, as Russell said, we, we do have a um, an accredited um, course uh, on uh, understanding mental health or managing mental health and again we provide you with a full toolkit on there so it's uh, over 150 pages of information with regards to many different mental health illnesses um, and then takes you on key steps about how you can support yourself and others managing mental health or even um, low well-being as well so it's a, it's a really good tool to, to utilize that but what I would say is just speak to them. That's kind of the main Absolutely. thing. And, and great, great for a plug because look, I, it is something that, that it sounds very dramatic. It's something that we're very passionate about. Um, I don't think there's enough out there, particularly offered into the corporate world. People talk about well-being in businesses all the time. Um, the reason I say this is I know there's at least three people on this call who obviously I won't name who have lost colleagues to suicide. Um, so it is a real issue. Um, so, mm -hmm. so anytime you think about this or you hear about someone committing suicide, it, it might be something, oh, oh, it's so-and-so, or I've read this in the paper, or I hear about someone doing this. 
But actually, these things are happening a lot closer to you and a lot closer to home than a lot of people would realize. And what we want to do is give everyone the, the skills to be able to have those conversations. And coming back to the other question about stigma and worrying about pouring your heart out, it also creates a much safer space for everybody else. So, you know, even the simple technique, Ben, that the, 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 you know, I remember getting from you when, you when you came back with your accreditation is about asking twice, how are you? Mm. Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, no, no. How are you? And it's amazing how many times I do that and I get a different response. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because we're just programmed to just get by and just go, yeah, everything's okay. Um, but yeah, it's really important to just kind of stop someone and just go, no, really talk to me and tell me what's going on. So yeah, that's a, it's a perfect example um, there, Russell. Okay. Um, and so sorry, yeah, ben, I've just got one more. Is just, please be aware this, that... This is just a yes or no. Uh, the IACT course is not the same as a mental first aid course, right? No. Um, so mental first aid is primarily focused on uh, supporting someone who has got a mental health illness. So it's, it's what we call a reactive uh, kind of way of dealing with it. The uh, IACT course uh, focuses on um, preemptive as well as reactive ways to support people. So how can we support people in making sure that their well-being is managed enough so that it doesn't drop low enough to develop into a mental health illness, as well as how do you help someone who is experiencing a mental health issue? Right, so so, so focusing sorry, on a number of elements. So a physical analogy is there, you can be trained as a first aider. So if I break my leg or cut myself, you can treat me, but also you can have a health and safety officer who prevents those things happening in the first place, right? Yeah, nice analogy. Okay, cool. All right, that's it. <laughs> I'm going to hand you over to wrap up. Thank you, everyone. It's been great to see so many people engage. Uh, really appreciate it. Great. Uh, thank you very much. So I've just uh, put one a small poll on Poll Everywhere. If you want to just uh, drop into that, um, just so you can tell us whether you're interested and you can leave us some details, uh, please do get in touch with either myself or uh, Ben. Uh, so I know there's two Bens. Two Bens. So either Ben or Benjamin at ignitetraining.com. Uh, um, if you are interested and we can get back in touch with you with regards to what we can offer. Um, and then just after this, um, I'm going to uh, just move on to the presentation survey. So if you could just uh, let me know um, how the survey went, uh, sorry, how the session went and uh, what you'd like to see more of. So uh, I'm just gonna move off this one onto the uh, Um, thank you very much for everyone's time. Again, sorry that we uh, went over there with the Q&As and uh, telling you what else we're looking to do in the future. Um, but please do look after yourself. Um, as everyone says, stay safe. Um, be more aware of uh, yes, hygiene. Um, but yeah, that won't develop into an uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, just keep uh, hygiene uh, aware is what the key point is. So thank you very much for your time. Um, and yeah, see you all Thank soon you. on our next one. See you soon. On Monday, on Monday at 10 o'clock with Russell. Perfect. Just a quick one. I know there's about 38, 39 people still on. I've just put a link uh, onto our website to the mental health program. Uh, there's two on there. So have a look around and, and um, see if we can help you with anything. All the best. Bye bye. Thank you.